The subject tonight about building trust in teams, this, this subject is geared primarily towards um, leaders or chief visionaries or whoever, whoever's kind of responsible for this adventure. Remember we said last night that church planting is an adventure. Um, I think any ministry program is an adventure. I think being a disciple of Christ is an adventure. I, I sometimes think that I could have had a much more boring life if I would have never gotten involved in anything uh, to do with, uh, with Christian ministry. Um, however, we don't, we don't go for the adventure, but the reality is, is often we find adventure in faithfulness and in obedience. We, we say yes to God, and he says, you have no idea where I'm taking you. Like if you consider the life that Abraham modeled when the Lord said, come to a place I'm going to show you, Abraham starts walking in obedience and in faith. He really didn't know where he was going. And what do we call people like that? that go somewhere where they're not, they don't even know where they're going. Don't we consider them generally kind of deranged or confused, or at least poor planners? That's what we often think of people like that. And yet, Abraham is, in scripture, characterized as the father of faith. Well, do we walk in his footsteps? Are we also Abraham's children? The New Testament makes it pretty clear that if we have put our faith in Christ, we are also Abraham's children. Another theme that we see in Scripture, when Nicodemus came to Jesus in the middle of the night, and he says, okay, now tell me, what does this really mean, and what are you about? Jesus' words to Nicodemus weren't some big exposition on who he was as the Son of God. He merely said... The wind blows, and you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going, but so is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. You kind of can't make sense out of it. That's that's really what Jesus said. You can't really make sense out of Christianity. You can't really make sense out of faith. Well, trust and faith are very closely related. There are very similar types of things in our hearts that are there, and we have a hard time putting our finger on it, and it causes us to do stuff that we can't really explain, but yet it happens. Because of our faith in Christ, we do things that don't make sense to many people. Because of our trust in God, which is really the same as faith in God, we do things that don't really make full sense. We do some things that are somewhat illogical. For instance, we go to a conference like this. In the middle of the work week, we could be doing something that other people would say would be much more productive. But we do this. Why? Because we believe it's worth it. So, Think of faith, think of your faith in Christ, think of trust, they're very related, that's what we're talking about tonight. If you have your handouts, we're going to get started, and we'll basically go through uh, this session as it's been, uh, been prepared. Why do we need to build trust? Well, first of all, that trust is the foundation of all relationships. If I don't trust you, I'm probably going to avoid you. It's just that simple. Um, trust is the foundation. The, the, what you have when you have a relationship is trust. And when you don't have trust, you, you have a former relationship. Or you, you used to have a relationship, but you're sure not. There's, there's, there's maybe an awareness of each other, but there isn't a heart connection if there is no trust. Now, society all around us is in a major famine of trust. At the core of the chaos that you see in people's homes is broken trust. At the core of the chaos you see in Washington, D.C. is broken trust. At the core of what you see when a police arrests someone is broken trust. 
something went wrong and somebody's investigating and somebody is blaming somebody for something, something bad happened, trust is gone. Uh, trusting relationships are at the core of our witness as Christ's disciples. Jesus said, I would want that you are all one, as the Father and I are one, I in them, them in us, oneness, togetherness. That speaks of trust, it speaks of unity, it speaks of harmony, it speaks of a heartfelt connection with each other that shows the world what God the Father and God the Son are like, and the Spirit. And if we can't live that out in our human relationships, our witness falls short of making it past our shoes. It just doesn't reach far. It just doesn't have any impact. It doesn't show anything. It's, it's kind of like a religious idea stuck in a filing cabinet. Nobody's reading it. Sounds good. Has no impact. For us to have impact in the world, we need to be in trusting relationships. That's particularly one reason that I believe that conservative Anabaptist people have a major opportunity in this area, but we also have some major growth to do in this area. I think it's kind of in our DNA, but to be honest, we're not living it out as well as we would probably say we are. We, we struggle. So... Trusting relationships are at the core of our witness that we are Christ's disciples. So what is trust? We're going to go through some definitions. Trust is a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability, the strength of someone or something. Have you ever tried walking across a bridge you didn't trust? In, in our town, in Dryden, there's this little swinging bridge. It actually goes across the river and stops. It goes to nowhere. It is merely there to be a bridge across a river. It's not there to take you somewhere. It's just the experience of walking on a swinging bridge. And it's right over rapids. And right now the water's really high, and this bridge is a bit rickety. Um, I know some people who would walk across it, and I know some people who would not. Okay? If you believe in the reliability of that bridge, you could possibly walk across it. If you don't believe in the reliability of that bridge, you probably shouldn't because you could die. Trust comes by living with our eyes wide open and experiencing reality. Many people tend to think of blind trust. Well, there's nothing blind about trust. There is some things that are blindness, but trust is not something that is a blind thing. Now, we're going to talk a bit more about kind of an expansion of this definitions over the next, over the next few uh, minutes. First, the foundations of trust are truth. Truth is at the foundation of all trust. If there is no truth, there can't be trust. If that bridge might have all the documentation about the weight it can hold, if that documentation is a lie and someone falls through and the bridge collapses because the documentation that says it can hold my 220 pounds, if it says it can do that and it can't, then somebody lied. And we're going to have to find that somebody and we're going to have to correct them. Truth is really important, is it not? If you're driving down a road and you see a bridge that says five tons and you drive your, your little Ford Pinto across this five-ton rated bridge and your Ford Pinto collapses this thing, how many of you are old enough to know what a Ford Pinto is, by the way? Okay, good. That's good. For those of you that are younger, um, I don't know. It's a good reason they don't, too. Uh, you know, the Chevy Cavalier. but that Yeah, Prius. Thank you. Toyota Prius. Some of you are into city stuff, so yeah. A lot of Prius drivers in the cities. Um, if your little car collapses the bridge because it was rated for five tons and it only held 500 pounds, somebody lied. What's advertised isn't what's real. Truth is at a foundation of trust. The second is transparency and familiarity. What if I come to the bridge and I see no signs? It tells me nothing. What if I'm driving a great big logging truck and I got to get the logs to the other side of the river? Would I not want to know? Now, if there's 
6,000 trucks that drive across this bridge every day, I'm probably just going to get in line and I don't care. Because I'm like, okay, what are, the, what are the chances? I'll be good. But if I'm the only truck that's driven across this bridge in the last 20 years, and there is no, nobody can tell me what this bridge is rated for, and I'm supposed to drive my truck across it? Well, I might want to have some answers before we go on this little trip. See, transparency and, transparency and familiarity, like, like knowing, is the real important part of trust. Knowing. When you think about the disciples and their interactions with Jesus, there was several times when they would say, okay, now, Jesus, like, how are we going to know that you're the Son of God? How do we really know? Like, what sign are you going to show us? One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus feeds the 5,000, and he says, you know, I am the bread of life, and your fathers had manna in the wilderness ahead of me. And, and, then, and then he, right after that, they said, okay, now what sign are you going to do to show us that you really are the bread of life and that, and that you are the Son of God? He had just fed them with five loaves and two fishes. He had just done the sign, and like 20 minutes later, they're saying, okay, what sign are you going to do to show us? That's real mistrust. Transparency and familiarity means we, we consider, like, what has been? What has been real? A part of uh, my job is to fly airplanes, and one thing I want to know is that the wings aren't going to fall off. How many of you have been flying in an airplane and wondered if the wings could fall off? Okay, good. I have too. And one of the things that I've had the privilege of doing is looking inside the wing structures, seeing really thin metal and a lot of little tiny rivets and um, stuff that you could take a claw hammer and just pound a hole right through it. It looks really weak. But then I've also had the chance to see some of the documentation that shows exactly how much weight it will carry before it bends and breaks, and it's unbelievable. But it's been certified to be true. It's been tested. Some independent person said, yep, actually, they said this airplane can hold 4,000 pounds. Yep, we put 4,000 pounds in it. Wings didn't fall off. Okay. There's some transparency, and we can actually believe it. We can put some confidence in it. Integrity and reliability are two other concepts that not only is it what it says it is, it is, it, it is, that, consistency. It is that consistently. The bridge hauls the truck not only on Mondays and Thursday afternoons. It actually does it any day of the week. It doesn't really matter what time of the year. You come to the bridge, it supports the truck. It's reliable. Lastly, competence. Competence means the people that are involved know what they're doing. When I come to a bridge, I want to know that the bridge builders knew how to build bridges. When I fly an airplane, I want to know that the people that designed it, they were actually engineers, and they knew what they were doing. I want to know that. And I can believe that that's how it is. And so these types of things are the foundations of trust. We can learn to trust, and we can build on trust. We can also live a very different lifestyle. We can live life very naively. Being naive means a lack of experience, a lack of wisdom, a lack of judgment. Naive is the product of avoiding relevant information. That means we don't go looking. We don't figure things out. We'd rather just not care. Now, I have a question. If you were to to decide whether or not to join a ministry team. Would you rather join a ministry team where you see these kinds of things, or would you rather just not ask? How you answer this question is going to largely determine the outcomes of your next five years. Okay? If you're going to decide just to not ask and not talk and live with your eyes closed then you should probably also plan on a lot of surprises. You're going to bump into a lot of things in the dark with your eyes closed, and you're going to stub your toes, and it's going to hurt. 
Being naive means living with our eyes closed. Being naive creates a shallow illusion of trust. It is not real trust. It is the illusion of it. And I think, personally, being naive is one of the biggest enemies of trust. I also think that naive people are very easy to spot if you become practiced at spotting naive people. And they can be taken advantage of very, very badly by people that make a practice of taking advantage of naive people. And I do think that our mission organizations have a major track record at recruiting naive people and then taking advantage of them very badly. And that's something that mission organizations need to work on. And I'm including Northern Youth Programs, the organization I'm a part of. It is very easy to look for someone that has a little bit of excitement and a little bit of vision and then tell them absolutely nothing about what their job will actually be like. Lead them to believe it will be great. And then once they're there, let the surprises roll in. That's not right. We can't live that way. That's irresponsible leadership. Actually, it's abusive leadership. It's taking advantage of people for our own benefit, and it's not right. Naivety is the silent enemy of trust. It means sticking your head in the sand on purpose, because that way you can't see what you don't like to see. Now let's talk about mistrust. Mistrust is this feeling of knowing that something can't be relied on. You don't have your head in the sand, you know what's going on, you have the information, and it isn't favorable. Mistrust. Many of us have been hurt by someone or some organization or something, and in that process, we have walked away saying, not for me. This was a bad experience. I will not trust that. How we come to that conclusion depends largely on the experience itself and maybe factors in our understanding, our view of the world before the event happened. We're going to talk a bit more about abuse in a bit. In in society around us, people get trusted for different reasons, and I think that in different generations, like within a, within a, I'm going to say a normal church, you have people that have some gray hair who maybe remember the wartime era of World War II. And you have people, that, that crowd is, is um, hardly around anymore, but, but the oldest people still remember World War II. The people that are like 80 plus years old now, they remember World War II, and they remember how people thought about soldiers. And if you, if you are in a, from that era, the people that, that are alive today that were young during a time of, of national crisis and war, those people tend to trust people based on how willing they are to make a sacrifice. You see, they, when they were 18, they heard stories about people jumping out of the back of airplanes while they're getting shot at. And, and honestly, the people that jump out of the back of airplanes while they're getting shot at, like that takes some level of sacrifice that I can't hardly relate to. And those people get memorialized. Those people get honored for their sacrifice. And so we grow up thinking that, well, the people we can trust are the ones that are willing to make a sacrifice. Now let's transfer that into a ministry setting. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to, to live in Mexico and sleep on a, on a little mat that's made of straw that's a half inch thick with bugs in it? Like those are the hero missionary stories that honestly attract many people to missions because they want to make a sacrifice and so they long for greatness, and they long for this larger-than-life um, ability to go do really hard things. And so to make a sacrifice is seen as a very honorable thing. And so we start trusting people if they're willing to make a sacrifice. In an industrial age or in an industrial community, you're trusted if you're productive. If you can work really hard and make a lot of widgets and make a lot of money, 
then, well, that means he's a successful person. And so if it's a successful person, then, I mean, just look at them. Of course we can trust them. And these aren't bad things. These are just dynamics that we face when we think about trust. Today, people are being trusted for being able to Google something and sound smart. It's the information age. People are trusted for what they know. And if you don't know, and if you haven't heard the latest on this and that, it's like, where have you been living? Under a rock? So how you think about the trustworthiness of other people says a lot about how old you are and about what kind of environment you grew up in. And I've I've seen old missionaries just like really not trust some young ones because they weren't quite willing to make some sacrifices that they made when they were young. It's like, well, what, what do you do with that? I think you at least talk about it. That's at least a start. So really, how you view trust depends a little bit on how old you are and how old the other person is that you're, that you're in a relationship with. Now let's talk a little bit about the actions that undermine trust. A a classic start is secret alliances. The minute that you have a team of people, let's say there's 10 people, and and if, if the leader of that group or if any two people in that group start making secret alliances and try to keep keep the rest of the team in the dark about what this little sideshow they've got going on, that starts to undermine trust. It will. It grows like cancer. It feeds into dishonest disclosures and partial truths. What if I told you all tonight that um, that uh, the food was really good tonight? Imagine I worked in the kitchen and I dumped something in the food that's going to make all of you um, sick. And I just don't tell you that part. I tell you about how good the food was. You would agree with me that the food was good. But I don't tell you about the miracle juice that I put in the soup that is going to make you sick. Would you not feel like I somehow lied to you if the truth came out later? You see, half a truth is a full lie somehow. Half a truth is not truth. Half a truth with the intent of misleading others will undermine trust. If not today, then when the rest becomes known. Something that also really harms the level of trust that people have is when people don't know where they're going to get publicly put down. Who likes to be made fun of or shamed? No hands. Nobody wants that. So how about we don't do it to others? because we just saw that nobody wants that. And if we can just make a deal among this group that we're not going to publicly shame and put people down without hearing or understanding their side of the story, surprise them with, with those kinds of things, we'll, we'll, it'll help our trust levels. Another, another part that goes along with dishonest disclosure is squelched communication. If what I tell my supervisor gets misrepresented to our board, somehow it will, it will violate trust in that relationship process. Sometimes we're in a position where we speak on behalf of other people, and in that process of speaking on behalf of other people, we can censor them, and we can actually misrepresent them in the process. It is important that when we're speaking on behalf of other people that we actually speak on behalf of them and not on our, what we wish they would be saying. The next one, uh, the avoidance of accountability. When individuals actively seek to avoid accountability, there's a lot of red flags that should be going up in our minds. Because avoiding accountability is a major underminer of trust. You know, I think everybody wins when accountability is there. And we're going to talk a bit more about accountability uh, after a bit. Taking advantage of others through deception. That can happen very easily. Half-truths, partial truths, uh, angles, political games, drama. Has anybody been a part of any of this stuff or 
is this all new to you? Okay, some of you are willing to admit it, and the rest of you just are shell-shocked. Okay, that's fine. Um, this can happen to you if it hasn't. It can, okay? You can actually do this stuff if you haven't. And I don't know, but for, for me, sometimes when I go through a list like this, I'm thinking about, okay, that person did this to me, and that person did this to me. No, what we really should be thinking about is I did this to someone, and then we should repent, and we should go apologize, and we should try to make it right. This last one is the aggressive domination of others. How many of you in your churches have individuals that are more powerful than others? Anybody? So you're normal too? There's churches where he's like, no, we're all the same. Okay, but the one guy talks way more than the others in Sunday school. The one preacher preaches four times more than anybody else. And when he preaches, he preaches five times louder than anybody else. Or something like that. You, there's these dynamics where there's like people that are just way more aggressive than others. It just happens. And sometimes individuals like that don't have an idea that they're being that way. And we can just be that way without knowing it. And we can railroad right over people. And we can dominate them. Not like we tried. It's just we didn't try not to. Many of these things are often done with a full feeling of self-justification or I needed to or I had to because I was justified because of something else. At the core of these behaviors are what, are what the book of James calls selfish ambition. From whence do wars and fightings come from you? Do they not come from the lusts that war among your members? Yeah. It's my own desires are at the core of this stuff. And whenever I'm seeing a lot of conflict, you know, the first thing we, I have to do is to go and look at myself in the mirror and say, Norm, what you been doing? What haven't you been doing you should have been doing? Where's your selfish ambitions? Is it there? Really, tough questions. We've got to ask them ourselves. As leaders, we need to be very aware that we have the power to hurt as deeply as we have the power to heal. If we're not aware of that, we might not be as humble as we should be. Now let's talk about abuse. I would rather talk about peace, love, and joy in the Holy Ghost and the fruit of the Spirit. But here we are as church planters and we're talking about abuse. Is abuse a possibility? Has anybody here experienced abuse? Has anybody here committed abuse? I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. I just assume the answer is yes on all, all the above questions. The effects of abuse on trust are that it violates our trust. Whether abuse being a sexual abuse event, whether it's a psychological abuse event, whether it's a physical assault or violence, the end result is leaving where a powerful person is leaving someone else with a feeling that they can never trust that person. And maybe they can never trust anyone. Many people come out of an abuse experience saying, I will never trust anyone. It's a belief that, or it's a feeling that people develop as a result of experiencing abuse. It is often followed by an I will not trust decision. I'm going to make it on my own. I'm not going to depend on anyone else. Now, many of you here developing a church planting team, say you're teamed up with someone who's passionate about the gospel, wants to see church planting happen. What you don't know is that they experienced abuse in their childhood and they have somehow said to themselves, I'm going to go make it on my own. I'm going to go be a church planter. Okay, how's that going to go? I can tell you from experience. I've been that kind of person. And it doesn't go well. You see, at some point, that way of thinking runs aground. And it runs aground with the people that we love the most. And if we've decided that I'm going to make it on my own, and I'm not going to trust anyone, because I... It hurts too bad to get betrayed and hurt. 
I will not trust anyone. If that's where we are, then we've got to deal with ourselves first and rebuild the ability to come to a place of being able to trust. If in our heart there is a deep decision that we're not going to trust, it will affect our relationships for the rest of our lives. It will turn into expectations of you need to perform for me instead of I will trust you and love you. It's what you're going to have to do for me. It turns into you need to rescue me and demands and broken relationships. It turns into chaos. There's hope. People who have experienced abuse can heal. They can recover. Jesus can rescue me. And often it starts with a belief that even if everyone in the world has hurt me, Jesus has still died for me, has he not? At some point, we need to be confronted with that reality. And we have a choice of whether or not we're going to actually trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Many of us have come to a place of saying faith in Christ, and yes, I want to follow Christ, and Lord, I want to serve you with my whole life. But there's many people who have not yet dealt with the fact that, that even if the whole world rejects and abandons and harms me, the Lord Jesus Christ still has died for me. And that's hope. I, I remember going through a very difficult time in my life, and I was talking to a friend, an older man, an older man that I have sat for hours with working together. And, and he said, I was just dumping to him about some of the chaos that I was involved in, the things that weren't working, the people that were, I thought, mistreating me. And he says to me, he says, Norm, you're never going to trust these people, are you? And I said, I don't know how I ever would. He says, well, it's going to have to start with you trusting Christ. And it was a, I mean, I was a missionary pastor at that point. You know, I should have known that by then. But he just kind of kindly took me back to first grade in the Christian life. And he says, you know, if you don't, like, just get that right, okay? And it was a major turning point. It was a way that I could start to take responsibility for myself and say, okay, well, at least I will trust the Lord Jesus Christ and, and let him deal with the people that I thought I couldn't trust. And it was a start of healing in those relationships. But I had to take responsibility. I had to confront my own issues. And recovery from abuse is as much about confronting our own issues as it is about confronting those that have hurt us. Deciding, I will trust again. Some practical steps to discover truth. We're going to go through these a little faster. We need to discover truth. We need to decide to trust. We need to engage in healthy conflict. We need to clarify our commitment to each other. We need to hold each other accountable. And then we can focus on results, goals, and objectives instead of on our dysfunctional relationships. This comes loosely from the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni, a book I highly recommend. So first of all, discovering truth. We need to expose truth. People need to talk honestly with words, not with grunts, thoughts, and emotions. Honestly with words, paragraphs, and sentences communicate truth. It needs to be verifiable truth. Often if a trust has broken down to where nobody believes anything anybody else says, then it needs to be independently verified, and that's where third-party investigations are really helpful. Now, if we are unwilling to go that route, then there isn't much hope to restore tr trust because truth can't be verified. If truth can't be verified, then, then there isn't much hope for restoring trust. So expose truth, talk honestly with words, open channels of dialogue, get the right people in the room so they can hear each other. This is messy work and it's the hardest work that leaders have to engage in. People need time to emotionally process the truth. One of the harder things is that sometimes in a, in a broken trust situation, people want to get together and they want to fix it right now because of how bad the situation is. Well, you can't fix it just right now. It takes time for people to really absorb the nature of the truth. If the truth 
is ugly, it takes more time. If the truth isn't that ugly and somebody was on a witch hunt looking for something ugly, well, it takes him some time to absorb the fact that maybe there isn't some, there's no smoking gun here. And it, it, people take time to understand what is reality. With that, fears need to expose. I, I remember one time being in one of these situations and, and there was this little fear that one person had. And it was a fear that they, they were afraid that they would get rejected they were afraid that, that they couldn't be friends anymore. And I was like, how could you be afraid of that? Like, don't you know? Of course we're going to love you no matter what. And, and, but, hey, this, this dear lady needed to surface the fear about, like, Sunday school. And how can that continue for her? And she just wanted to know that she's safe. Well, little fears like that, when they get exposed, it's like, ah, oh, we can deal with that. Of course we can. And it's like, man, peace gets restored. And it, when, in a discovery process for truth, sometimes the truth is so ugly that we need to form an action plan for vulnerable people. Vulnerable people are basically anybody who is unable to protect themselves from, from the reality. If we, can't, if we can't take care of the children or the elderly or the frail, then, well... We need to figure out how to do that in the process of discovering the truth. It's not truth at, at the cost of the vulnerable. Okay, so the first major step in restoring trust is to discover truth. The second major step is a decision to trust. Trust is a process of setting aside fear and taking relational risk. You know, after we've discovered that the bridge is worth driving on, and it actually does haul the load, somebody still needs to decide to put the truck in gear and get the front tires out on the bridge, right? It's a decision. Trust involves dealing with the past hurts in as much detail as those feelings hinder the relationship. You can never fix the past and you can never change it, but you can overcome the feelings associated with it. In as much detail as those feelings hinder the relationship. Trust involves setting boundaries for ourselves as to how much we will trust another person, especially in a relationship where someone more powerful has hurt someone who is generally weaker. Say a dad is hurting a child or a, a pastor is, is been abusive to uh, congregants um, or a supervisor or a boss has taken advantage of one of his staff, then there sometimes need to be boundaries put in place where the vulnerable person can be reassured that it's not going to happen again. And they get to decide as to how fast they want to come back into that relationship. Sometimes we think of trust as a blank check. Well, I'd like to ask you a question. Who all do you trust with your blank checks? Pardon? Your wife. Yeah. Probably not me. Yeah. You shouldn't. I mean, I didn't work for that money. You see, trust is a filled-in check, not a blank one. I will give the waitress at the restaurant the size of check that she earned, and I think that's the way a lot of our relationships are. We give as much trust as has been earned. We don't want to give less, and we probably don't want to give a lot more. And so if you think about your relationships, especially team relationships, some people, right, they're new. You just, you just got to know them a year ago. Well, how much are you going to trust them and with what? Everything? Come on. Are you going to let them... Really? Everything? No. Your children? Your checkbook? No. That's ridiculous. That's not what we're talking about. But... You will trust them with something, a lot more than nothing. And trust is a filled-in check with an amount you've decided. An amount you've decided. We need to give ourselves permission to trust as much as is needed and as is warranted. When I deal with abuses, because with abuses, it's like none, ever. Well... Really? Do you want to live your whole life not trusting anybody? Probably not. 
deal with it. Get yourself to the place where you can decide how much you want to fill in on the check. Ladder of accountability is really a process of going from victim mentalities to accountable behaviors. Instead of, in a victim mentality, things happen to me, and it's like, I can't help myself because this happened to me. Like, the whole world's bad, and it's been hurting me. Sometimes people get stuck in a message where that's all they talk about. But then accountable behaviors is like, things happen because of me. I made this happen. And I, if, you, if you see the process of going from blaming others for everything to being the adult in the room that makes good things happen, like, that's the kind of person we want to be. We want to be at the top of this ladder. And I think church planters really need to live at the top of this ladder. But you might get teammates, or you might yourself remember a time when you've been sitting here, personal excuses, like, I can't go because, you know, I'm getting, I bought two oxen. Like, whatever that story was in the Bible where somebody was quite full of excuses. No, move up the ladder and make it happen because you can we sometimes talk about holding each other accountable, and there's two ways of holding each other accountable. I'd like for you to consider this. Say you and your teammate are living in this, uh, in this church plant, and the one person doesn't show up and consistently starts to not show up. Like, what's your approach? You know, I missed you last night. That's one approach. Another approach is like, you should have been there. Is there, do you notice the difference in tone? We need you versus, hey, you know what? You're not pulling your share of the load. Right? Both kind of say the same thing, but they say it very differently. And how you communicate when you're holding someone else accountable says a lot about your heart. And if somebody comes after me with a, well, you should have been there. You're not pulling your share of the load. That's actually not even going to make me feel like coming next time. But if somebody comes to me and says, man, I love working with you. Like, I really missed you last night. Like, things just go awesome when you're there. And I was really struggling. I was like, well, I'm going to want to help out. And it's a different way of bringing accountability. So think about your approach when you're holding someone accountable. I get sad when versus you make me mad. Um, always and never statements. Usually when things have gone pretty far off the rails, people are always right and never right. And, you know, it's always and never instead of sometimes when you... When you're correcting a part of the team, you're actually correcting a part of your body. How do you take your broken arm to the doctor to get a cast put on it? Do you beat your arm up on the way to the doctor? Bad arm, bad arm. Why did you do that? Why did you get yourself broken? We got to go get you fixed. You're making me late for work. That's not what we do. No, we, we very carefully hold that arm and we, we, we ouch over every bump on the way to the doctor to get that arm fixed. And then when the cast is on, we still protect it for another six weeks. We're careful with that broken arm. You know, a team member that is hurting, that, that is struggling, is like that broken arm. We want to care for them not just beat them up more. The way you do it to your teammates should reflect how you wish to be treated. Now, building trust through the lens of the four stages of team building. In the forming stage, nobody really has a tested trust of anybody. The team members are focusing on their own objectives, they're assessing the leader. Uh, criticism often happens behind the scenes. And there's a lot of individual effort, but trust is not a tested thing in the forming stage. As a leader, in the forming stage, we want to cast vision, we want to invite participation, we want to offer opportunities, we want to accept input from the team, and the team gets to respond to that. They analyze it, they give feedback, and they get involved. In the storming stage, the role of the leader is to serve the team by creating a safe environment for people to talk. And if you can create a safe environment for people to talk, the issues that separate and divide or, or cause differences come to the surface quicker and they get handled in a much more healthy way. There's no replacement for team leaders to pray for the team. Sometimes we as leaders, we start to see people's faults and we focus on that. 
And again, do we pray for them or do we just get frustrated? In the storming stage, it is really the role of the team to start to trust each other and start to fill in the check as to how much to trust each other and trust the leader in their facilitation of, of that stage. In the normalizing stage, it becomes more about processes and the leader facilitates processes, habits form, things become normal. Bible study is always on Tuesday nights. Well, it's been on Tuesday nights for as long as we can remember. Well, somebody at some point had to make a decision to make Bible studies on Tuesday nights. Well, in the normalizing stage, it's just we're, we're, we're doing what we've done. We're, things, things have developed a, pro, a process, we, and we, the team can start to trust the process. In the performing stage, the leader takes more of a coaching role. He evaluates mission and vision and he deals with succession planning in the team. And the team starts to trust the team, not only the process, but the team. It's like, we trust each other, we know what we're doing, we, we, we believe that we can actually carry the load. Once a team starts to trust itself, of course, through the power of the Holy Spirit, if a team isn't getting in situations that require crying out to God, then maybe you're actually not a ministry team. But if a team sees itself as welded together and they mutually face the challenges they face, they cry out to the Lord together, then you're in a performing stage. I'd like to give you one story. In a number of years ago, our organization was facing a financial shortfall at a board meeting, and I had done as much fundraising that year as I ever had, and I was tired of it. And in Northern Youth, fundraising is primarily an administrative issue, not so much a board issue. And we came to board meetings near the end of the year, and we were facing a deficit that we had never seen before. Now, I don't know, maybe some of you here are wealthy, and that would never be a problem. It's a problem you can't relate to. Well, I couldn't relate to ever not needing money. I, I have never been a wealthy person by many standards. And here, we, I felt like we were drowning in financial need. And... This board is full of conservative Anabaptist pastors, businessmen, and we faced that need with a great deal of fear. And I don't know what inspired us, but like usually when you're talking financial reports, you're looking at numbers and you're, you're just looking at big things like that. And I, I remember very clearly telling the board, saying, you know, brothers, this problem is bigger than me. I have tried harder than I ever have before, and it's failing. It's not working. I don't know what's left to do. I said, I feel like a dead horse. You can whip me harder, and I won't pull more. That's where I'm at. And I think that kind of got everybody's attention. Like, the solution wasn't, Norm, try harder, call more people. That's not going to work. I said, I said, I, honestly, men, I don't know what else to do. And now here, picture this. There was 25 people. There's the board, a, a advisory council, and then the administrative staff. I said, I really don't know what else to do. I said, I just think we need to get on our knees and cry out to God. So that's what we did. 25 men on their knees. Not like a lot of people pray in church, they stand up to pray. And no, we weren't standing up to pray. We were on our knees. And around the circle, 25 men prayed. I don't know what happened, but the deficit went away. Didn't come back the next year. 
or the next year, or the next year. What? Trust the team within the context of trusting God. If you can trust God and bring the trust of God to the team and lead the team to trust God and trust each other, then are we not actually experiencing what Jesus prayed for when he said, I in them, them in us, them being one as the Father and the Son are one? Is that not what we're experiencing then? If, if we love each other while we are loving God, I think that's what that means. And I don't know, it's just an experience that has stuck with me because it's like it was so real. Like nobody wants to go broke. And, and yet, like we're serving God, we're like, we believe he provides. And well, do we or don't we? Or how, how does this work? So trusting the team while trusting God. I'll give you a bit of an example. Like, like one thing that I know about soldiers in the military is that they're trained to trust each other. And, and they say that there's not many atheists in foxholes, but I don't think the military really teaches people to pray much. And they, they sure aren't like necessarily like believers <laughs> or take a football team or a hockey team they're trained to trust each other and you can train you can teach people to trust each other it in and of itself doesn't make them more righteous but when god's people trust each other what's the potential hereby will the world know you're my disciples jesus is our foundation and he's trustworthy. If you forget everything else I said tonight, remember this, that Jesus endured. He actually made it to the finish line. Jesus didn't go halfway and say it's too hard and stop. He endured. He's trustworthy because he endured. He's perfect. Jesus is the flawless, spotless, precious lamb of God. Jesus does, like, you're, you can do a character evaluation of Christ all day long and you're not going to find anything wrong. He's perfect. So he's trustworthy. Jesus is aware. He knows everything. You can look this in, uh, in Hebrews 4, 15. He knows. Jesus isn't trustworthy because we don't know anything about him. Jesus isn't trustworthy because, well, his real baggage is hidden. He just doesn't show us. No. There's an awareness, there's an openness, there's an honesty, an integrity, a transparency with Jesus. That's beautiful. He came to the world, he says, you know, he come from heaven. He just, he just showed himself. He didn't hide himself, except to those that wouldn't believe him and had already decided that they wouldn't. First Peter 5, 7, Jesus cares. Sometimes we form a picture of God as a tyrant. And I don't know how that comes except from maybe if our earthly fathers are tyrants or we have experiences with leadership where they're tyrants. But Jesus is not a tyrant. He's a caring shepherd. And we can trust him because he's not out to get us. He's out to love us and to care for us. And so we can trust him because of that too. Now, now church planters and by extension, pastors have the task of being called to being an under-shepherd, to be a leader like Christ was. I say that with a lot of fear and trembling because I know how far I, call, I fall from that. Now, don't blame the model. God set it up that we take our cues, our examples, and leadership from Christ. So, Jesus is this. He is trustworthy because of this. He calls us as under-shepherds, as servants of the church, to 
to walk as he walked and to live like he lived. I, I, I don't know, folks, you can work on other people your whole life, but your real job, my real job, is to work on me and become this way. And if I work on that, I don't think that it's possible to live without people paying attention to the faith that I have in the Almighty God. It will cause people to ask questions. They're going to want to know what's different about this. Like, why are you kind when others aren't? Why are you honest even when it costs you? That's what we're called to. God, unity and diversity in community for eternity. Lord, help us to be that way.